We're good to go, Glenn. Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, good evening to everyone. I would like to call this special meeting to order and indicate that it is being held electronically as per bylaw number 37-2021, section 3.10, which allows for electronic participation of council meetings. In calling this meeting to order, I would like to welcome all members of council and staff that are in attendance and our Huron County planner, Selena Whaling Ray, and any members of the public that are in attendance this evening. This meeting has been called to hold a public meeting for a zoning bylaw amendment application. Do any members of council have a pecuniary interest in relation to this agenda item this evening? Thank you for that, seeing none. As to the delegation, that is Selena Whaling Ray, our county planner, and that is the zoning bylaw amendment application a file a Z07-21 Lobel Sand and Gravel. I would entertain a mover and a seconder to adjourn our council meeting, please. That is moved by Councillor Miltonberg, seconded by Councillor Fisher, that Ashfield Colburn Wallenosh Township Council hereby adjourns our special council meeting. All in favor of the motion. That is carried. I th thank you. And a mover and a seconder to open the public meeting, please. Moved by Councillor Vanstone, second up by Councillor Snowblin, that Ashfield Colburn Walwanosh Township Council hereby opens the Planning Advisory Committee public meeting to consider the zoning bylaw amendment application made by 1142059 Ontario Limited slash Asher Planning Inc. All in favor of this motion. And that is carried. I thank you for that. Council has been provided with a report prepared by our county planner, Selena Whaling Ray, regarding this zoning bylaw amendment. Ms. Whaling Ray will review the application with the Planning Advisory Committee. At this time, I would like to call the Township of Ashfield Colburn Wawanosh Planning Advisory Committee meeting to order and ask if anyone has a pecuniary interest to indicate at this time regarding this agenda item. Seeing none, the purpose of this meeting is it is a public meeting as has been indicated to consider changing the zoning on the property described as concession two, ED part lots 14 and 15 and RP 22, R6090 part one, RP 22 R6857 Colburn Little Lakes Road. This is a requirement that the public meeting is being held under the Planning Act, which requires the council hold at least one public meeting and that proper notice be given. The application process is that an application was submitted by Escher Planning Inc. to the Township of Ashfield Colburn Wawanosh and considered complete on the 17th day of June, 2021. Notice of this public meeting was mailed by the municipality to all property owners within 120 meters of the property on the June 23rd, 2021, and notice was posted on the subject property. Comments will be received first from our county planner, then the applicant and or agent, and then members of the public. And finally, council will have an opportunity to ask any questions or make any comments. So at this time, I would like to indicate that our staff will bring meet, uh, individuals into the meeting. Please use the raised hand function to indicate that you would like to speak and our staff will bring them in in that order. I would re request that all comments this evening. Be very respectful. We are dealing with an issue, not any personalities. And the code of conduct will be upheld and any derogatory comments will not be tolerated. And I'm sure that everyone will abide by our ACW code of conduct. So with that, Selena, we would like to welcome you to address this planning advisory committee with your comments, please. Welcome, Selena. Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mayor McNeil and Council for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I'll just get myself uh, ready here. 
Okay, um, so this evening we are discussing uh, zoning bylaw amendment 07 2021. As mentioned by the mayor, uh, the property subject to this application is legally described as concession to Eastern Division, uh, part lots 14 and 15, as in reference plan 22R 6090 part one and reference plan 22R 6857 parts one, two, three in Colburn. The owner of this property is 1142059 Ontario Limited, and the applicant on their behalf is Escher Planning Inc, uh, care of Melanie Horton. So the purpose of this zoning bylaw amendment application is to change the zoning on portions of the subject property that are currently zoned general agriculture or AG1 to extractive resources or ER1. And this is proposed in order to permit aggregate extraction on the site. So here is a 2015 aerial photo of the property. Um, the county's GIS department has generously provided this mapping um, to, that identifies many of the features referenced by members of the public in their written comments. So the entire subject property is shown here outlined in yellow with the black hatching over top of it. It is 83 acres in size. It fronts onto Little Lakes Road to the north, and it is bordered to the east and the south by the Maitland River, as we can see here. Uh, immediately west of the subject property is an active gravel pit, and I'm going to refer to this as the Fisher Pit, as it is referred to in the public comments. Um, Balls Bridge, which is indicated by the star on the map, is uh, 225 meters east of the northeast corner of the property. So the property is currently designated extractive and natural environment in the ACW official plan. Uh, the portions designated extractive are currently zoned general agriculture or AG1, while the portions designated natural environment are zoned natural environment or any one. And as mentioned, the applicant is proposing to rezone those areas currently zoned AG1 to ER1 in order to allow for aggregate extraction. Uh, the portion of the property subject to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, or what we'll refer to as the site, is 57 acres in size. Uh, the areas of the property designated natural environment are identified as significant woodland in the ACW official plan. The aggregate resource inventory paper, or ARIP mapping for Huron County, does identify the site as an area of secondary significance, uh, containing sand and gravel material. So properties surrounding the site that you can see here on the map are zoned general agriculture, extractive resources, natural environment, and natural environment special zone, the special zone being to permit a recreational residence. The property immediately south of the subject property that you can see between the property and the river, address 38163 Little Lakes Road, does have a registered right of way over the site for access to Little Lakes Road. And then as mentioned, uh, the Fisher Pit is immediately west of the subject property, and it has been recently purchased by the owner of the subject property. So concurrent with this application, the applicant has submitted an application to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, or MNRF, uh, for a Category 1 Class A Pit Below Water License under the Aggregate Resources Act, or ARA. And as noted, the applicant is proposing to rezone the portions of this property presently zoned AG1 to ER1, and no changes are proposed for the portions of the property zoned NE1. It is noted for Council and for those in attendance tonight um, that the ARA application is subject to MNRF approval. A requirement of the ARA process is that the appropriate zoning be in place for the subject site, and this is the municipality's extent of involvement in that separate process. So here is a map, again, drafted up by our GIS staff that shows uh, recreational trails surrounding the site. The Maitland Trail is depicted here uh, in a dotted green line, and you will note that it currently crosses along that west property line of the subject property. Uh, the Maitland Trail is typically used recreationally for biking, hiking, or sorry, not biking, hiking, cross-country skiing, and snowshoeing. Um, the Ballsbridge side trail off of the Maitland Trail is shown in the orange dotted line and it's going east down Little Lakes Road from where the Maitland Trail meets the road uh, from the south. And then the current G to G or Goddard to Guelph Rail Trail detour route is shown in black dotted lining and that's going along Little Lakes Road and then up north on River Lime. Um, 
Okay, so here we have the proposed operational plan for the site. Admittedly, it is kind of small on the screen, but it can be better viewed in the report for this application. So this is uh, sort of page one, and I'll flip to page two here. So the applicant is proposing to rezone the lands presently zoned AG1 to ER1 in order to establish a proposed extractive operation. And sand and gravel are proposed to be mined from above and below the water table to provide a proposed annual tonnage of 500,000 tons. It is estimated that this site does hold a resource volume of approximately 4.36 million tons, and thus that the lifespan of the operation would be between 10 and 15 years. Proposed hours of operation for the site are Monday to Friday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Saturdays from 7 a.m. through noon. Uh, the operator has noted that it is anticipated that operations on Saturday will be occasional and infrequent. So as demonstrated in the site plans on the screen here, the pit is proposed to operate in two general phases, allowing extraction to occur on the east portion of the property that you see identified as area one, and then proceed toward the west once extraction in area one is uh, complete into area two. Existing vegetative features uh, in the northeast corner of the property closest to Balls Bridge are shown to be left in place. Uh, fencing is proposed along Little Lakes Road. Originally, the application proposed for main access to the site to be provided off of Little Lakes Road. However, the applicant has since indicated that the operator now intends to direct traffic generated by the proposed pit through the existing Fisher Pit entrance. And as demonstrated um, in this map here, the Fisher Pit entrance is located on Lawnsboro Road or County Road 15. The Little Lakes Road entrance is proposed only for emergency and Uh, service vehicles, i.e. not commercial application. It will have an opportunity to amend the submitted site plans to reflect same once the MNRF has completed their review of the application. So this on the screen is the proposed rehabilitation plan. Uh, the applicant is proposing that the site be rehabilitated to natural environment and agriculture uses at the end, end of the proposed pit's lifespan. The rehabilitation plan submitted with the application shows what's referred to as area one and area two in the site plans to become ponds, with the perimeter of the site proposed to be put back into agricultural production. So the applicant has submitted uh, the documents listed on the screen here in support of the zoning bylaw amendment application, those being um, a hydrogeological report, a natural environment report, a noise impact study, an archaeological assessment, a planning justification report, site plans, and the rehabilitation plan, along with the uh, required ARA documents. And here's just a timeline for folks uh, just to orient themselves with sort of where we're at in the process at this point. So Maitland Valley Conservation Authority or MVCA has delegated authority to review that hydrogeology submission for the purpose of this application. So at the time of application submission, MVCA did obtain the services of a third party to provide a peer review of the hydrogeological assessment. The planning department on behalf of the township also obtained third party reviewers for the natural environment report and the noise impact assessment. And those three reviews took place throughout May and June, and those findings have since been provided to the applicant for further comment. Um, so since the writing of my report, uh, a response to the noise peer review has been received by the applicant, and it is currently under review. It is anticipated that MBCA, the township and the planning department will continue to work with the applicant in revising those submissions to hopefully uh, satisfy municipal requirements. So at, the at this time, written letters of objection have been received from 19 members of the public. Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes, which is an incorporated organization, has also submitted a letter of objection on behalf of its members as well as a third party uh, natural environment report submitted with the application and a uh, legal opinion on the ARA application. Uh, the organization's president has confirmed that the organization has 12 executive and 160 members at the time of our correspondence. The board of directors of the Maitland Trail Association has presented um, some, or sorry, has voiced some concerns about the proposed pit. 
but they have presented some requests for consideration in an effort to find uh, middle ground with the applicant as it re relates to mitigation measures for the trail. The municipality of Central Huron has also submitted correspondence stating that they do not support the application. Um, the comments received from the public have been summarized for council in Appendix A that was attached to the report. The main concerns arising um, tend to be the impact of the proposal on the environmental sensitivity of the area, the impact of the proposal on the area's cultural and recreational value, the current state of Little Lakes Road and its ability to support commercial trucks, uh, loss of farmland, and whether appropriate Indigenous consultation has occurred. Uh, the applicant has also forwarded comments submitted as part of the ARA application process from the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation. While these comments are with regard to the licensing proposal and the ARA application, it is noted that this community have identified uh, minimal concerns with the proposal at this time. And the applicant is working with Soggy and Ojibwe Nation as well um, to review that ARA application. Um, MVCA and the Huron County biologist have been circulated on the application, but they have not provided comment yet. They will once um, those final hydrogeological and natural environment reports are amended and submitted as per the peer reviews. Huron County Public Works have confirmed that they have no comments or concerns with regard to the proposal for the existing Fisher Pit entrance to be utilized for truck traffic. And finally, no comments have re been received at this time from ACW staff. So now I'll just run through some images of the site and the surrounding area for council and the public. Um, so here is a view of the west portion of the property, and this is looking south from Little Lakes Road. Um, the Maitland River is south of those trees that you can see in the distance here. And here is the east portion of the site. Um, again, looking south from Little Lakes Road, the trees in the distance are on separate properties. This photo was taken uh, on the east portion of Falls Bridge, looking west toward the site. If we reference again that aerial mapping here, um, those trees that you see in the image are not part of the subject property, but rather are on properties east of the subject property. Uh, this photo was taken between the two little lakes that surround Little Lakes Road, closer to River Line, again to the east of the subject property. Um, again, this is just to give an idea of current road conditions just based on public comments received. And finally, this photo was taken um, looking east towards Balls Bridge from the northeast corner of the site. You can't see Balls Bridge in this uh, image, but it is through that clearing that you can see in the distance. So um, in terms of the process, the MNRF regulates the licensing and operations of gravel pits in Ontario through, again, that Aggregate Resources Act. Um, a requirement of that licensing is that the subject lands are zoned to allow for aggregate extraction in order for that license to be issued. And so, so it is recommended at this time that ACW Council hold the public meeting for this application uh, for the purpose of obtaining input from members of the public and receive this report for information purposes. A future report will be submitted containing a policy review, uh, written responses to public comments, and a recommendation. Um, once those comments are received and the application submissions are finalized uh, with regard to that natural environment and hydrogeological assessment. So that will conclude uh, my presentation for now. Happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selena, for that very detailed report. Uh, now, Florence, uh, Clerk Witherspoon, would you like uh, to bring in the applicant and or agent if they would like to address this public meeting, please. Sure, if the applicant would like to speak to address council, if you would like to utilize the raise hand function and we can bring you in. Otherwise, we'll just wait a couple minutes. Here we do. All right. And Caitlin is bringing Melanie Horton in of Escher Planning. Thank you very much for that. Welcome, Melanie, and if you would Thank like you. to uh, make some comments on behalf of the applicant and or agent to this public meeting, please, welcome. Thank you, Mayor McNeil, uh, members of council and staff and members of the public that are here this evening. Ho hopefully you can hear me if I'm shouting, just uh, somebody put a hand up. Um, 
And thank you very much, Selena, for the very thorough overview of the application. Um, I do have some slides uh, that I'll share. I think I can share a screen here. Um, yes, can you see can. that? Okay, thank you. So, at, at, and there may be a little bit of duplication with the material that uh, Selena has presented, but uh, just some additional comments on, on the application for uh, council and for the public that are at the meeting this evening. Um, so as we've heard, there's an application uh, for the Little Lakes Road gravel pit. Um, the numbered company is uh, in the license would be, a license application is, is under Lobo Sand and Gravel. And Lobo Sand and Gravel is part of Van Bree group of companies. So there's Van Bree Sand and Gravel, Inland Aggregates, um, this is a family owned company uh, that has been operating uh, in Huron County and Lambton County for over 50 years, uh, very well established and, and good experienced operators. Uh, on the call or in the meeting this evening, Jeff Van Eyck uh, with Van Bree is, is here. Um, also attending uh, Kevin Trimble, who's the lead ecologist on the project team, as well as Derek Flake, uh, the noise engineer. Our hydrogeologist is in Algonquin Park at the moment without Wi-Fi access, but if we have specific questions, I'm happy to follow up with him. Um, so as we've heard from, uh, from the county planner, the application is for Class A, and Class A means uh, an application that's over 50,000 tonnes per year. Um, category 1 is a pit below the water table. Um, the licensed area in yellow on the, on the air photo here is 30.8 hectares. And within that, there's an extraction area of 22.9 hectares. So the balance of that land is, uh, that's not to be extracted is in setbacks. And then there's a central wet thicket area in the eastern part of the site, east of the laneway, that's outside of the area of extraction. The proposed annual tonnage limit max as a maximum is 500,000 tons. And as we've heard, the proposed hours of operation, seven to seven weekdays, seven to noon Saturdays, and that would be occasional and infrequent. You can see here, and we've heard the Fisher Pit is the property immediately adjacent to the west of the site. Uh, this was recently, in the, within the last year, acquired by Lobo Sand and Gravel, uh, and they have begun operations at that property. Um, this allows for the uh, shipments of material from this Little Lakes property to be routed through the Fisher Pit out onto Lonsborough Road and not onto Little Lakes Road. So that is, uh, that is um, the plan. I just wanted to mention briefly the official plan designation. As you heard, the, the property you can see in purple here is designated e extractive. Um, and, as, and as some of you may know, a number of years ago, it's probably 15 years ago now, Huron County undertook an aggregate strategy, an aggregate resource strategy, um, which in my experience is fairly unique in, uh, in the province, that a county uh, would go ahead and look at um, aggregate resource areas and constraint mapping as uh, to identify areas to be protected in official plans. Huron County is one of the few counties in the provinces of Ontario that, that proactively uh, designates areas as extractive. So that is, that is uh, notable. The two quotes there are right from the official plan. Um, and they say that the strategy recommends that primary and secondary areas of resource with zero or one constraint be designated as extractive resource. And that's to protect the aggregate for future extraction. And secondly, based on the recommendation of the aggregate strategy and in consultation with the public, areas designated extractive resources on Schedule B have been identified. This consultation with the public, that, that in the official plan, that's referring to the aggregate strategy consultation that occurred, not the consultation on this application, just, just to be clear. I know this gets, this gets confusing, this application. Operations and phasing, uh, Selena did a good job of going through the, uh, the operations plan, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. But in general, the proposal is that the site would be extracted from east to west in two areas um, separated by this laneway uh, that provides access to the uh, house uh, in the center, south center of the property. The berms, uh, there will be berms constructed, uh, and you can see them in sort of gray sh shaded area on the east corner of the property. Uh, those are for noise control. 
there are also limits to the type of processing that can occur in this area again as as noise considerations and those have all been identified in the acoustic uh, the noise impact report the site will be progressively rehabilitated so as extraction occurs uh, rehabilitation happens uh, as soon as the extraction is finished in that area and the intent there is to limit the areas that are disturbed at one time um, any areas that are not being extracted or rehabilitated uh, will be maintained in agriculture uh, as the site's operated. There's been a, a, a lot of concern and a lot of questions um, about Balls Bridge and Little Lakes Road. And I, I just wanted to, to make it clear that as a result of Lobo Sand and Gravel acquiring the Fisher Pit, uh, there's no gravel truck traffic proposed on Little Lakes Road or on Balls Bridge. So I just wanna make that, that point very clear. The entrance that's shown on the site plans at the west end of the site would be utilized uh, strictly for employee access, so a pickup truck or a car, or for emergency vehicles um, if, if that's, uh, they need to access the site. And again, the acoustic berms located on the northeast corner of the site provide noise protection for the homes that are closest to the site, and that would also serve as protection or noise attenuation uh, for anybody who's on Balls Bridge or fishing uh, in that area or enjoying a picnic or a wedding. Um, there's also dust controls that are mandated by the province that are in place for every aggregate operation, and they'll be in place for this site as well. Uh, natural environment, again, uh, some, some very uh, significant features in the area, particularly along associated with the Maitland River, um, so that forested valley corridor, um, that's all been recognized in the natural environment report and potential impacts on significant features of the site and adjacent lot lands were uh, identified. There were multi-season field work undertaken, um, for amphibians, breeding birds, wildlife and plant observations, as well as a vegetation inventory. I should mention here that those, the field work was on lands that the consultants had access to. So uh, where they weren't permitted access, uh, inventories weren't taken on, on the, entire, uh, the entire landscape. Um, the area of extraction is currently planted in corn, so no trees uh, are proposed to be removed within that extraction limit. And there are uh, a number of recommendations in the natural environment report that have been incorporated into the site plans. The extraction, as we've heard, would be below the water table and with uh, results creating two ponds uh, with final rehabilitation. Um, aggregate extraction below the water table is a mechanical process. So you can see the picture on the top there is a drag line. It's basically a bucket that scoops sand and gravel out of the water uh, and leaves it in a windrow for the material to dry out. And then it's uh, taken to be uh, either screened into different sizes of sand and stone or there's uh, a crushing um, that occurs periodically on the site. So there's no chemicals, there's no contaminants. It's, it's a clean uh, process. Um, there was a hydrogeology study undertaken, and as Selena mentioned, uh, there's a peer review ongoing through Maitland Valley Conservation Authority. Um, the study I, uh, examined impacts on groundwater resources, so that's residential wells near the site, but also on natural environment impacts. So looking at maintaining that groundwater regime to ensure that there's no, uh, no adverse impact on any of the sensitive uh, natural heritage features. Uh, um, the image on the bottom here is just monitoring well locations and there are a number around the perimeter of the site where uh, monitoring would be ongoing through the life of the site. There's a lot of information on this slide, but I just did want to try to attempt to uh, explain the two parallel processes here that are involved in an aggregate application. So on the left-hand side of, this, of the uh, screen here, the Aggregate Resources Act, um, which is administered by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, um, they uh, are responsible for reviewing the application and ultimately, if the zoning were in place, uh, would have the authority to, to uh, issue a license. Um, so every gravel pit and quarry operation in the province of Ontario must be licensed or permitted by the ministry. 
Um, those applications were submitted to the province in February of this year, deemed complete in March. Um, there was an information session held virtually uh, on May the 25th, and there may be some folks in attendance here tonight that were at that, uh, that session. We had quite a good turnout. I think there were close to 100 people at that uh, session. Uh, we did videotape um, or video record that meeting, and it's available um, through, I think one of the community groups, I believe, has posted it on their Facebook site, but I'm, I'm also able to share that if, if anybody's interested in, in uh, seeing that meeting. Uh, the application was circulated to neighbours within 120 metres, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, including the Species at Risk Branch, uh, OMAFRA, the Conservation Authority, and municipalities for review. Um, in addition, and I wanted to make this point because it's come up in uh, many of the, the emails and letters that I've received have, have uh, suggested there has not been fulfillment of duty to consult. Um, that's, that's not actually the case. Uh, so as m &R had identified three groups, um, Aboriginal groups with interest, who may have treaty interest in this area, uh, this property specifically, those being Chippewas of the Thames, Kettle and Stony Point, and Saugeen Ojibwe First Nation. So each of those groups has been, uh, as you heard, heard from the Chippewas of the Thames that they have minimal concerns. We have not heard anything back from Kettle and Stony Point, and there's ongoing discussions with uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Um, by the way, they do their own uh, peer review of hydrogeology and natural environment and archaeology. So those, in addition to the peer reviews that the um, municipalities undertake, uh, the First Nation is also doing uh, doing reviews of the studies uh, with a particular fo focus on issues that are of interest to them. The comment deadline on the aggregate application was the end of June, um, and the ARA process allows up to two years to try to resolve objections. And an application like this one where there's a significant amount of community interest, a lot of questions and concerns that have come up, um, it's, not, it, it's not uncommon to see that full two years being taken um, in a diligent effort to really work with the community and see how many objections can be um, resolved. So that would take us to April, 2023. Um, certainly, if there's an opportunity to resolve issues prior to that, then the application can be completed and filed with the ministry. Where there are unresolved objections at the end of that process, the application automatically is referred to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, or LPAT. So there's that, that's the ARA process. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, the Planning Act process, and that's our meeting this evening. Uh, is uh, our application to rezone the property uh, to extractive, just the agricultural portion. So as was mentioned, there's no change proposed to the natural environment uh, area zoned on the property. Um, we've talked about the peer review, so I won't repeat that, tonight's public meeting. And at some point in the future, there would be a staff report coming back to council with a re recommendation and ultimately a council decision. But again, the timing of that is very much contingent on having questions answered and, and enough information for staff to be able to uh, prepare a recommendation. And lastly, I just wanted to provide a couple of, uh, couple of slides here um, showing progress. These are actually final rehabilitation. So these are some of the other sites that Lobo Sand and Gravel has operated and uh, so on the left there, I believe that's their bingo pit. So that's being actively refarmed now. That was extracted. That was a gravel pit, uh, same as the pond on the on the right. And again, a couple of low water sites nearby that Lobo Sand and Gravel has rehabilitated. Um, they've they've been commended for their rehabilitation efforts. They they do an excellent job, and they they really um, take good care of the properties that they uh, they operate. So those are all the, the comments I have, uh, Mayor and Council, and uh, I'll turn things back over to you, Florence. Thank you very much, Melanie, for your uh, comprehens comprehensive comments. Much appreciated. Clerk Witherspoon, are you aware, is there anyone else from the applicant and or agent that would like to 
address this meeting at this time? Or would you like to proceed with the raised hand function to any other individuals? And if you could maybe, uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. So at this time, uh, Mayor McNeil, it's, it is the time on the agenda where we would bring in members of the public to speak and address the application. Um, so we did receive a, a number of requests to speak. So we do have a list here and we will um, have those members of the public uh, speak in the order that we did receive them. So if you did request to speak, if you could please raise your, use the raise hand function and we will allow you to, um, to come in um, one at a time. Please do, once you've finished, you can, um, turn uh, off your raised hand function. Um, however, um, if you have not yet spoken, please leave it raised so we know who to bring in. Once we have final, once we have all gone through the list of, of folks who have requested to speak, we'll open the floor to anybody who um, has not requested but would still like to make a comment. Um, and then after that, um, council will have an opportunity to um, ask any questions or, or make any comments as well. So, okay. And we'll go from there. I would like to indicate to everyone that Caitlin Boss uh, is our uh, community support uh, person on staff, does a tremendous job with our uh, facilitation of these Zoom meetings. We uh, certainly appreciate it, Caitlin. Welcome, Rebecca. And uh, if you would like to unmute, and address this, uh, make your comments to this public meeting, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, thank you. Great, thank you. I'm just going to give a brief introduction and then a number of our members of um, Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes will um, give presentations, short presentations, and then I'll come back towards the end and give a presentation then. But I just wanted to give you a little background on who we are and what we've been doing. So first I would like to thank Mayor Glenn McNeil and the councillors, um, the Township of Ashfield, Colburn, Wawanosh for hosting this meeting and for all, and I'd like to thank all of those who worked hard to set it up. I want to give a special acknowledgement to Florence Witherspoon for her patience and support and to Selena Whaling Ray for her excellent work and her ever cheerful patience and encouragement. My name is Rebecca Garrett. I'm president of the Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes. My family home is, is a, right across the road from the proposed Little Lakes pit. It's been almost a year now since we first heard about the plans of Lobo Sand and Gravel to create a massive aggregate mine combining the Fisher Pit and the Little Lakes property using the name Little Lakes Pit. We found that out um, last August. The company claimed in the public information session that Melanie just uh, referred to, that was in May, to have done extensive community consultation. However, the residents most affected by the proposed pit were not consulted at all, and neither was the Balls Bridge and Little Lakes community. So we've just stepped up to do what was necessary. Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes grew out of what used to be Friends of Balls Bridge, which was formed in 2006 when the historic Balls Bridge was threatened with demolition. Our community is diverse and strongly united. What we have in common is a love of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes Road, and a desire to protect this irreplaceable area for future generations. We're now an incorporated group with an executive and a steering committee and over 150 engaged supporters. And we forwarded, I think, just a selection of letters from the supporters to you, to the members of council, there were over 150 letters written to MNRF opposing this application. And they were uh, from all different points of view, all different walks of life. We didn't want to completely overwhelm you. So we just sent a selection that I think is in your package that you can read. Our group has been working hard to protect the historic Balls Bridge and Little Lakes. It was never the intention of our community to become involved in township planning and learn the language of ministry rules, regulations, and governance, but we have done our best to learn. We understand that complicated rules, regulations, laws, legislation, and bylaws are there to protect the public and preserve its valuable resources. We retain the services of an environmentalist uh, who will speak later 
uh, very soon actually, terrestrial biologist Sarah Mangai last fall. And this spring, an environmental legal team, um, David Donnelly from uh, Donnelly Law, uh, Environmental Law and Rod Northey. We are citizens who are brought together by our love for this special place, and we are counting on you as stakeholders and caretakers of our community resources and assets and representatives of the will of the people to work with us to protect what is valuable and irreplaceable for everyone in the township and the county and, below, and beyond. So uh, now I'm going to stop sharing or uh, stop. Um, well, I wasn't sharing, was I? I'm just going to put my hand down if I can figure out how to do that. Yes. And I'm going to let Sarah Mangai uh, take over and, and um, talk to you about some of what was in her environmental report, um, of which you have a copy, I think. Okay. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for your comments. Okay. Welcome. Sarah, and we invite you to make some comments at this time, if you would, please. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor and members of council uh, for the chance to speak. Um, I'll share my presentation. It's just a very brief presentation and gives an overview of my review of um, the uh, application, if that's all right. Can you see that? Yes, we can. I'll put it onto a slideshow. Well, my name is Sarah Mengi from North South Environmental uh, Incorporated, um, and I'm working for Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes. And uh, I've reviewed the Natural Environment Report uh, with some review of other uh, of some of the supporting reports uh, in order to inform my review of the natural environment, because especially with respect to water, um, natural heritage and water are very interconnected. Uh, my first um, review was of the uh, methods that were used um, in doing the natural environment surveys. Um, the first comment I had was that background information didn't include citizen science databases like uh, iNaturalist and eBird. Um, it also didn't seem to include any information from local residents and naturalist groups. And uh, this, I think, is important because of the trail that's already been identified as uh, going th through the site or at, along the site periphery um, provides a very good uh, vantage point for um, naturalists and other groups for finding um, significant observations. There are some very well-informed citizens about natural heritage in this area. Um, it appears to have a quite a low survey effort. There were five surveys that uh, seem to be dedicated to natural heritage. I think this could have led to an incomplete understanding of the natural heritage functions on the site. Um, in particular, um, I noticed the amphibian surveys uh, appeared to be incomplete. Um, the earliest survey was aborted because of bad weather. It got too cold. Uh, and the importance of that is that if weather gets too cold at the time when you're doing amphibian surveys, uh, amphibians stop calling. So you definitely have um, an underrepresentation of the number of amphibians that might be calling from a pond. And amphibian breeding habitat is considered one of the types of significant wildlife habitat um, that it is protected by the provincial policy statement. Uh, the surveys seem to be focused on the tableland. Um, I understand that uh, some uh, areas couldn't, it didn't receive um, permission to access, uh, and perhaps that should be further explained where those were. Um, the, the actual river corridor seemed to be much less surveyed than other parts of the site when it came to um, bird surveys especially, uh, and there were no surveys along the what is currently proposed as the haul route. Um, I do understand that uh, there is a proposal to uh, direct the haul route through the Fisher Pit, but at the moment all we can comment on is the, the route that's currently shown, which uh, goes west along Little Lakes Road through the Little Lakes um, to River Line on the west. Uh, these are some of the um, sightings that uh, the, the surrounding residents um, have 
put together. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide. I don't want you to try and memorize every bit. The, the things I wanted you to, to see were uh, bald eagles concentrating, congregating along uh, the river in the winter. Um, so wintering uh, eagle habitat along the river, there are a couple of, of uh, sightings of bald eagles where they congregate. Um, and that there are quite a few turtle sightings. Uh, there's baby turtle sightings indicating, you know, potential nesting in this area and adult turtle sightings. Uh, some nesting turtle sightings over here. Um, and the other uh, thing there are quite a few of are uh, amphibian breeding calling. Uh, observations. So the central wetland on the site, there were uh, reports that that you could hear a, a deafening chorus of um, amphibians singing from that area. And also um, within the little lakes, there were uh, loud choruses of um, amphibians. Uh, there are some sightings of queen snake, which is an endangered species protected by the Endangered Species Act. Uh, there were reports that they've been um, seen uh, on Ball's Bridge, and there are other reports that they've been seen along the river to the north. This is considered a vulnerable area for Queen Snake in the ACW official plan. Um, as I say, there's inadequate surveys for uh, endangered Queen Snake um, uh, associated with this uh, application. Um, there is an area of vulnerability for queen snake shown in the ACW official plan. Uh, I understand that queen snake is highly dependent on riverine corridors, but uh, there's very little known about this snake. It's a very elusive snake and not much um, known about where it hibernates and where it nests. And one of the most important um, sightings or uh, observations is that it may seek out seepages, um, areas of groundwater discharge upslope of the river and corridor quite a lot further from the river than um, is often reported. Um, and Ontario protocols for SAR snake surveys, species at risk snake surveys, show uh, that 10 surveys are an appropriate number to conduct and there were only three conducted for, uh, for, this, for these surveys. Um, there were some other constraints that weren't uh, investigated as much as I think they should have been. Uh, significant wildlife habitat is protected by the Provincial Policy Statement and the Ashfield Colborne Wawanosh Official Plan. And there are several aspects of this site that are very well maybe related to um, significant wildlife habitat. So seepages were reported in the hydrogeology report, but they weren't discussed in the uh, natural environment report. Seepages are considered significant wildlife habitat on their own, and as I mentioned before, um, they may have particular importance for queen snake. Uh, habitat for breeding amphibians, um, which was noticed in the on-site wetland and along the Little Lakes. Uh, significant wildlife habitat for breeding amphibian is determined by the number of amphibians, the total number, and the, um, and the number of species. And uh, when I hear um, reports that they're very loud choruses or deafening choruses, uh, that is likely that they're um, abundant enough to be considered significant wildlife habitat and that should be resurveyed. Um, the wetlands may function as overwintering habitat for turtles, which is another form of significant wildlife habitat. Uh, there are nesting habitat for turtles um, in several areas that uh, are also considered significant wildlife habitat. Um, there may be wintering habitat for bald eagles along the river, uh, which is another form of significant wildlife habitat. Um, the Little Lakes themselves, which are the three small lakes at the junction of Little Lakes Road and River Line, um, are immediately adjacent to the currently proposed haul route, and they apparently have very many significant wildlife habitat functions including uh, turtle nesting, turtle overwintering, and amphibian breeding habitat. So why is this important? I think the significance of the river corridor, though it's been stated, uh, has been underestimated. Um, there's a 10 meter buffer proposed along the Maitland River corridor. Um, and when you consider the types of uh, protective buffers that are um, imposed along very highly significant features in other parts of the province, uh, 30 meters 
is considered um, one of the most uh, standard for protecting highly significant features. Um, the species reported by residents along the river corridor do have a high sensitivity to disturbance, including wintering bald eagles and queen snakes. Um, I think the significance of the central wetland may have been underestimated. Uh, it wasn't surveyed under, it was surveyed when it was too cold. The number of breeding amphibians was reported to be low, but it was admitted that, that this was done under conditions where it could be expected to be low because of the weather conditions. Um, and there are many potential negative impacts uh, associated with the current proposed haul route. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll be here to answer questions later if, if needed. Thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate that. Uh, Clerk Witherspoon with the raised hand function. Do you see anyone else that you would like to bring into the meeting, please? Yes, um, the next person we have on the list is uh, Michael Gregg. So there Thank you looks very like much. Been brought in. Welcome, Michael. And if you'd like to turn on your video and your audio, we would uh, look forward to your comments, please. I believe you're currently uh, muted, Michael, and if you'd like to turn on your uh, video, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor McNeil, and thank you, members of the council. Hey, um, I'm going to give a brief, brief crit critique today of the stage one and two archaeological assessment um, that was prepared by ACOM Incorporated in support of the application by a, a Lobo sand and gravel to operate a category one class A gravel pit. A, um, and as you can see, I'm not quite prepared. Oh. And I better have, I better leave the, 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 this as it is. Um, of, the, of the site to the Maitland River. Um, the ACOM study, which was conducted in 2019, uh, concludes that the potential mm -hmm. for the recovery of a pre and post contact First Nations and 19th century Euro Canadian archaeological resources is high. Now, there was a pedestrian field survey and a shovel test excavations that were conducted in one day in 2019 on June 21st. But these, uh, but this survey and these test uh, excavations yielded no artifacts that are associated with ver various periods of human occupation of, a, of this region over the past 11,000 years. Um, that there were a 30 centimeter test pits uh, that were excavated, although this is not a, the number of this is not identified a, uh, in the uh, archaeological assessment. And these uh, uh, test pits were between 40 to 50 centimeters in depth, generally just going right to a little below a, uh, um, the agricultural plow zone. A, and this is likely to be of in soils that were a only, only in soils that were deposited within the past 1,000 years. Now, human groups, have, as I've said, have been in the Great Lakes Basin over the past 11,000 years. But the AOCON study did not include examination of levels that, uh, for any potentially deeply buried Aboriginal archaeological resources. And these res uh, resources may unwittingly un be uncovered uh, through operation of a gravel pit. Now the AOCON study also relies solely on a quite outdated and colonialist Indians of Ontario publication by a uh, James Morris that was written in 1943 to describe the treaty agreements that were reached between representatives of the British Crown and the Ashinaabe leaders a, 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 of a, um, the Western a, a, a Great Lakes Basin at Amherstburg in 1825, as well as again at Amherstburg in 1822, uh, concerning their surrender of lands within the Huron Track and acquisition by the British Crown. 
Now the authors uh, have cited this uh, quite outdated uh, a volume, but they appear to be unaware of much more recent a, a, a work that's been done uh, by a historical research consultant by the name of Karen Travers, at, a, who was at York University, and wrote a doctoral dissertation entitled Seeing with Two Eyes, Colonial Policy, the Huron Tract Treaty, and changes in land in Lambton County between 1780 and 1867. Now in this work, Travers asserts that a, uh, the namesake of a, um, a uh, Wawanosh Township, a uh, Joshua a Wawanosh, who was a chief of, a, uh, of a, uh, uh, the Ashinabe and signatory to Treaty 29 and many other Ashinabe leaders, they believe that they retained a interest in lands a, from the Osabo River to Godchenoan Sound, and that the a, um, 1836 Saugeen Treaty, which was signed by the a, uh, Ojibwe of a um, of the Saugeen, that it was invalid without their consent. So that's what a um, Travers a, uh, asserts. Now, 18, and she also presents evidence that in 1842, a dozen Ashinaabe chiefs, including a Joshua, a, a Wawanash, a, um, discussed emigrating to the Saugeen to create their own reserve and petitioned the lieutenant governor of, a, a, of then a, a, of a uh, Canada West to help them secure these lands. Now this is, this is an 1850 map of a, um, that includes a uh, Ashfield and Wawanosh and Colburn a, a townships. And just north of, of, the, of the, uh, these townships a, on this map, a, you can see there's a, an area that's been designated as Indian territory. And these were where the, a, uh, the Ashinaabe chiefs were hoping to, um, to say, be able to settle. A, and, a, and of course, this map a, um, a would suggest that there is a, a, a there is no European settlement a, 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 in these lands at that time. Now, the Huron Tract was surrendered and acquired by the Crown under Treaty under Treaty Twenty Nine, the preamble of which notes that His Majesty was desirous of appropriating for the purposes of cultivation and settlement attractive land that is here and after particularly described, and it is described in Treaty 29. But this treaty makes no mention of whether His Majesty had any interest in acquiring lands for the, extractors, for the extraction of mineral resources, particularly of land and gravel, sand and gravel. I would, I would suggest that in making your decision on the zoning of the bylaw amendment, a application by Lobo Sand and Gravel, a, uh, that you consider the original intent of Treaty 29 and take it into, a, uh, into account. And this was for the providing of land for, a, uh, for the cultivation of crops and the building of settlements for the colonists of the Huron Tract and not for the mining of mineral resources. Now the AUCOM study also can, a, ar the archeological assessment also contends that the founder of Huron County is considered to be John Gelt, a businessman, author, and adventurer who was responsible for creating the Canada Company, which encouraged a uh, settlement within the county. So this is with an assertion by a, a, a Ocom, and this, but this contention is a uh, highly debatable. Now, as, as the first superintendent of the Canada Company, Gelt was certainly instrumental in attracting settlers to the Huron Tract. However, these lands span more than a million acres a, with a, uh, that, are with, that are today within the present day Huron, Perth, Middlesex and Lambton counties. And Galt himself, he resided in Guelph, not in any of those, a, uh, of those counties. A, uh, and he was recalled to Great Britain a, uh, for the mismanagement of funds in 1829, long before the legislative assembly of Upper Canada authorized the separation of the county a, uh, from, of Huron County, a, uh, um, from the London district in 1838, 
or the creation of the Huron District in 1841. I would suggest that uh, William Tiger Dunlop, the, the Canada Company's a, um, a warden of, of the forest, is a, a is much more likely candidate for so-called founder of Huron County. A, uh, Dunlop established a base at Goddard in 1827, and the site was initially the site where he established that was a was a uh, at a uh, a uh, Harbor Park, a uh, um, and this was his, where he built his original residence. A uh, but a, a settlement gradually developed, and a uh, Dunlop was subsequently elected to represent the newly created Huron District in the Legislative Assembly in 1841. Now, the AOCOM assessment, archaeological assessment of Balls Ridge recognizes the, ten, the tangible features and details that help make the bridge historically significant. However, it makes no mention of its many intang intangible attributes, such as the serenity and vibrancy of the landscape on which it is situated, nor does it provide any insights into the stories customs and activities that are, have been shared at this location by individuals and communities throughout Huron County and the wider world. At the unveiling of the plaque commemorating the bridge in, in, in 2011, the former Ontario Minister of Tourism and Culture, Michael Chan noted that the unique design and structure of Balls Bridge not only speaks to engineering history, but also make it an attractive feature in the local landscape. And here's the local landscape as seen from a recent aerial view. A, um, and, the, and the heritage value of Balls Bridge and the landscapes uh, on which it sits, they will both be destroyed by this pro proposed gravel pit. And I would ask you to please consider a, um, in as, as much as you can a, just the value of the heritage value and the natural value of of a um, of this environment, and a uh, please can a uh, protect it for for the generations to come. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to a uh, a uh, to Melissa and a uh, to Jennifer for use of their photographs, which I did without contact. Thank you very much, Michael, for your uh, presentation to us. It's appreciated. Clerk Witherspoon, do you have uh, anyone else that you would like to bring into the meeting with the raised hand function, please? Uh, yes, next up we have Daryl uh, Ball. Welcome, Daryl. Hi, Greg, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, and if you'd like to turn on your video, Daryl, that would be wonderful. Yep, you're good now. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. And um, it is nice to follow up with the presentation that just preceded me. I'm going to uh, speak tonight about the Paul's Bridge and some of the family uh, history and what we've, we've gone through. In 2006, as been mentioned earlier, the Paul's Bridge was designed at des destined for the Wrecking Ball. And that was the same year that the Friends of Paul's Bridge was formed. In 1885, it is the oldest bridge of this style still standing. Using wrought iron makes it extremely rare, according to Architectural Conservancy of Ontario and the Heritage Branch of the Ontario Ministry of Culture. In 2007, Paul's Bridge was downloaded from the County of Huron to ACW in Central Huron, along with a check of $250,000. Also in 2007, a steering committee was made up of two representatives from ACW, two representatives from Central Huron, and three representatives from Friends of Bowles Bridge. And at that time was presented with a check from the province of Ontario of $242,000 through an infrastructure grant. In 2008, the bridge was open to light traffic of no more than four tons weight limit. During the re rehabilitation, the bridge was determined to be in excellent condition, but the foundation was crumbling. The bulk of the 300,000 to reconstruction was spent on redoing and repairing the foundation. Very little money was spent on the bridge. 
a study needs to be done to establish the effect of vibration of the heavy equipment and what it will do to this historic bridge. We will not get any more government grants again that we have already received. In 2008, the Friends of Balls Bridge was rewarded with a Cultural Landscape Heritage Award from the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. We won over five other nominees from across Ontario. This was due to a very limited, untouched natural setting of Balls Bridge with a pristine surrounding. In 2011, the Balls Bridge was again presented with the Ontario Heritage Trust Award, better known as the Gold and Blue Sign of Historical Significance. Over the years, the area has become extremely popular with bikes, snowmobilers, canoers, hikers, hikers, weddings, wedding proposals, wedding pictures. And on May 2 for this uh, weekend this year, there is over 100 canoers and kayakers using the area, stopping for loading or unloading the equipment. There is many complaints given about not enough parking at the Bowles Bridge area for the amount of traffic and stopping and starting that was done there. This area must be protected. Thank you very much for, for listening to my report. Thank you very much, Daryl, for your uh, comments. It's appreciated. Clerk Witherspoon, uh, would you like to bring anyone else into the meeting, please? Um, next, I actually have Elizabeth here too. Yeah, we're on the same same. Uh, we're on the same feed. Have you got me? Oh, I apologize. I got, yeah. So Elizabeth, um, we'll uh, we did have Richard, but we'll we'll work with you first. How's that? <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Are you okay? No problem. No problem. Please go ahead, Elizabeth. Uh, and and I have a PowerPoint presentation I'd like to share. So I'm just going to put my screen share back on. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Glenn McNeil and Council for having us here. And again, uh, the Clerk Florence for all the hard work you've done in organizing a um, a group that's learning all the time. In a manner of introduction of myself, I am Elizabeth Vandenbroek and many of you guys will know me already. I have been on the Towns Economic Development Committee. I am an owner of Elizabeth's Art Gallery on the Square in Godridge and have been for almost 30 years. I am the current chair of the Godridge BIA and have sat on the County's Cultural Mapping Committee and the Huron County Cultural Planning Committee. As you can see, cultural planning and cultural assets are a big thing in my world. I'm just gonna move on. If I can get this to slide forward. Next. Most recently, I have a new love and I have managed to become the caretaker of this amazing stone estate. This is the original ball house. I'm sorry, Daryl, <laughs> but it is my heart and soul. I am so blessed to have become part of this story, this community heritage, and this ongoing thing that we are preserving for generations to come. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see the original stone house with all 13 inhabitants. And the way it is now, this is a picture I took in early spring because there's so many trees, it's actually hard to see the house through the trees. I am so proud to be part of this and to be a member of the Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes and to be on that board. There is a lot of historical significance to not only the bridge, and Daryl did allude to the fact that pin connected truss bridges, as this one is, are very rare in Ontario. We need to protect these artifacts. This is a picture I took last night of our beautiful bridge. I'm a visual thinker, so I'm showing you a lot of pictures because you need to place yourself here. You need to bring yourself into the feeling, not just the visual, but the sound of the air, the noise that the bridge makes. Have you gone over the bridge lately? The th -th 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 sound that cars make as they go across, that's part of the experience. Whether you start on the bridge and approach from Baseline Road, or whether you start at Riverline and approach down Little Lakes 
roads through the lakes bridge, not just the lakes, but everything in between is part of this gem. This is a cultural heritage landscape as it's meant to be. Where else would you direct somebody to have a peaceful entrance and a safe way to stop with an entire family on a bridge to go rafting? All of the bridges that I'm aware of are located on highways and are fast moving highways. This is a very safe place for our residents and our visitors and our tourists alike to visit and just enjoy what ACW and Huron County has to offer from a cultural tourism. Those that come here are coming to stay, they're coming to bike, they're coming to hike, they're coming to fish, raft, to catch crayfish, and I've heard a lot of squeals from the river uh, across the way as little girls are learning how to pick up crayfish and minnows and, you know, sometimes leeches, it's okay. It's our river and it's what it has to offer us. Over the last 30 years at Elizabeth's Art Gallery, when people have come into the gallery and asked, what do I need to see in Huron County? I have always directed them, you've got to go see Balls Bridge and Little Lakes River. Road. It is the most beautiful road in Huron County. I've had lots of reports back. Thank you for sending me on that drive. That was truly amazing to see and experience. Where else would you send someone in Huron County when you, they ask you that question? This drive, and you can see very clearly from my aerial shot, the scale and scope that a pit would take. The entire greenscape that's on the left side of that road would be gone. And so close to the bridge, you can see from this visual, the proximity that that scale would overtake in noise, dust, vibration, the loss of wildlife. It's huge. This is monumental. This is no small thing. The Little Lakes. I actually didn't realize that the one little lake was quite so big. The one on the right actually extends quite far, are amazing. So I drive this road every day on my way to and from work. I'm getting in a little bit of trouble because of the dust on my car from my husband, but that's okay, I'm willing to take it. Every day down this road, a red-tailed hawk greets me at the post across from the significant wood lot that's right on the Fisher Pit, that small triangular, a turtle, I move off the road every once in a while when I approach the curve coming onto River Line. And for some reason, there's always a chipmunk crosses my path every single day. I say good morning to him. You've seen these maps, but the pictures that I just showed you before speak much greater volumes than maps do. If you look at the upper left corner, again, the scale and scope that this size of pit would take on this precious, gem of an area. It's about the experience of the whole place, not just the pits. Not, the pits there will reduce that experience exponentially. The animals will leave, the dust, the noise, the visual aesthetic. Now as an artist, of course, I have to speak to visual aesthetic because that's what my world is, is visual aesthetic. We'll be gone. Uh, that snapping turtle uh, greeted one of my dogs in the field the other day and and uh, what a lovely treasure to say hi to him. Little Lakes Pit, is that what the story we want to tell? Uh, there's that red-tailed hawk that I was telling you about and the bald eagle that flew over my yard every day this current winter spring. Little Lake Road is a tourism corridor. It is a place we send and attract our tourists to. According to the World Trade Organization, there is a shift away from active holidays, and I've been part of the um, Huron Arts and Heritage Network and Ontario Arts Council and, you know, Huron Tourism. We know that there's a shift to experiential tourism. We know people want to have experiences. There is actually tourism enthusiasts that go after heritage landscapes. Many tourists seek these out during their travels, and why don't we push even further to present our place as one of these destinations? It is an untold gem. We need to tell that story. The other day, when I was on the bridge, as I often am, sitting and sketching, an entire family, not just one or two, but literally about 20 of them, pulled up 
offloaded every manner of floating object. And I stood on the bridge for about a half an hour and listened to them while they blew up their floaties and got ready, their giggles and laughter. I was actually really jealous of this family as they were getting ready to embark on their journey, maybe from Balls Bridge to Lonsboro Bridge. <laughs> Some of the floaties, I think, appeared too small for the people on them, but they had the time of their lives. I was so impressed that they would do this for their children and give them this memory. This is my family, my grandson and James and Chelsea. I want this little guy to experience all the things that I just showed you in the previous picture. I want him to learn about nature and the value of tourism and history and culture and art that we can present to him. On your website, the township is a vibrant rural community, is one that the agricultural productive areas of Ontario I feel this when I drive our road. I feel this when I drive ACW. I feel this when I drive here in County. It is an oasis. And as you can see, I've created my oasis of cottage country life, a strong feeling of community, which I have felt through the community of the Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes. It's a working, relaxing atmosphere. And I hope that you will help us preserve and protect this. Arts and culture represent 25 billion or 3.3% of the province's gross domestic product GDP and over 286,232 jobs, according to the Ontario Arts Council in April of 2019. Historic culture and tourism is part of that. Long before I moved to Little Lakes Road, which has been my dream for the last 20 years to own a property here. I cannot believe this dream has come true. I have migrated to this area to paint. The painting on the left called Breaking Away is actually the site of the proposed pit. It's a painting I did several years ago before I knew about any of this, before I knew that I could live there. I draw what has meaning to me and and before any of this this is an image that had great meaning to me and uh, our our cultural landscape is as important as the historical built structure our agricultural landscape and the passage through that corridor is part of the experience the painting on the right is called little lakes mosaic and it is again an older painting but just can you feel the the love and the ecology that is just bursting at the seams in that place i wish i actually could play you some of the frog sound and the bird sound when you stop and rest and sit for a moment in that narrow passage as the road wends between these two places just give me one sec I'm very emotional about this because it's so important that we preserve and protect this place. This is sunrise on the Little Lakes. Again, please just stop and feel this place. Feel what it's like to sit still and immerse yourself in what is culturally significant in our, our county. As an individual that's been involved in here in Arts and Heritage Network and Tourism, I have managed to create a living in a rural economy with an art gallery. I have been in business for over th almost, like I can't say over 30 years, but almost 30 years. And I have succeeded where many do not. I understand the value of art. I understand the value of illustrating our heritage. I understand the value that tours come to this area. This house, the settler, held a house in valley. Now there's a forest in the way, and I love my forest and every tree in it. And they settled in that place, 
And the stone house is part of the heritage. The stone house is part of the heritage landscape of this district. This is one of my first paintings of this place. I bought this house and this property for my future. I bought it so that I could have painting workshops in the future. I bought it to attract artists to be able to share with them the value and visuals of this area. I bought this place and invested in this place to be able to show other people how special it is and to invite them in and share my landscape with them. With the impending pit, I fear that the specialness of this place is going to get lost along with my plans for it. I fear that my desire to stay and paint for my retirement and my future was focused on painting this area and my experience of it will be lost with the loss of value to Ballsbridge, Little Lakes and what makes it special and attractive. I fear that the value of my property and how it's so intrinsically tied to the value of the bridge in that the builders of my property were the builders of that bridge and the love story that goes with it will be lost if people will no longer value the bridge because they don't want to visit it because they don't want to drive past a gravel pit and listen to noise while they sit and try to enjoy this peaceful place. My future is about painting this area. This is a painting I've just started. It's um, just a sketch. And I think it's very important that we document our culture and our history and our built heritage in many different ways. And this is my skill. And this is how I plan on documenting what we have to offer. Are familiar with Jack McLaren at all, you'll know this piece just came out of the Huron County exhibit, is a painting of Balls Bridge at Moonlight. Not only have I not seen a Moonlight painting by Jack, who was considered to be one of the eight members of the group of seven, but it also is a painting of Balls Bridge. I bought this painting months before I had the opportunity to buy the property and it just seems so special that it all came together and I now can stand in the same spot that this painting was painted from and revel in the fact that this is my legacy going forward to share similar types of artifacts. Going back to a more technical thing, within the Huron County Cultural Plan, uh, we've created a, a county mandate and in that strategic planning, we wanted to look at our built assets and utilize them and enhance them for existing events, benef benefit through increased regional promotions of our cultural assets. We need to look at what we have and how we can use it and anchor it for tourism. We know that because of the pandemic that backyard tourism or visit your backyard has been um, pushed. This is our backyard. This is what we want to show people. Uh, the creation of cultural heritage tours was also part of the mandate. Um, in the strategic direction uh, of the cultural heritage plan, one of the directions was to advance the municipality's role in cultural development and continue to support the leaderships in ways that they'll benefit the entire sector and community at large. It's not just the little community that lives at Ballsbridge that benefits. It is a much greater, much greater community. We want to preserve and promote our cultural heritage for future generations and build appreciation, appreciation and respect for our individual and shared histories. You can find this report on creativehuron.ca. Once it's lost, it can never be regained. It is our privilege as a community and our duty to preserve and protect what we have. We we can't go backwards. We can. Only, you will have seen the beauty of this place through my eyes. I hope you will go drive the road, stop and listen and be peaceful and take in the colors, the saturation, the feeling of being in this place. Thank you so much for listening. And I'm sure I've missed things, but um, it's in my letter.
it's in your book. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your passionate uh, presentation uh, this evening. Clerk Witherspoon, uh, would you like to bring anyone else into the meeting? So next we've got um, Richard Vernon. Welcome, Richard. Uh, you have your video on. If you'd like to unmute, uh, please proceed with your uh, comments. Great, thank you. I'm actually Richard. Sally is kindly, kindly let me her, her computer as my Zoom isn't working this evening. Um, so thank you very much for the chance to, to speak. Um, I won't keep you long. I just want to say a couple of things as the property owner who likely is the person most directly affected um, by the proposed pit. So my land uh, is to the east and south of the proposed pit. It's a semicircular piece of land uh, following the bend of the river. So the pit would sit in the middle of the semicircle and I would be very much aware of its presence all the time. Um, the pit wouldn't so much be my neighbor, it would be more like a sort of permanent uninvited guest in the middle of my life. Um, so I'd just say something first about the part of the proposed pit, <clears throat> excuse me, which is next to me. Uh, so as uh, the county planner has explained, the land of the proposed pit falls into two halves. Um, part one is to the west of the stone house in the middle of the land, and part three is the field um, to the east of the stone house, and part two is the field which is next to me. Um, <clears throat> now, um, no one can say that that field was the ideal place um, for a pit. I don't need to go into details because a lot of this has been covered already. Um, it contains several acres of wetland. It contains a watercourse running into the main. It's bounded to the southwest by provincially significant wood woodland and significant wildlife habitat. It's next to several popular tourist designations. And it's very close. It's not an ideal place for a pit. I mean, you know, <clears throat> even his best friend could never say, you know, hey, look, this is a good place to put a gravel pit. The policy statement of 2020 says that pits should be located in places where there is the least possible conflict with other land uses. This field is a place of maximum conflict with every other land use. Um, now, one would hope that if a pit had to be put in an unsuitable place, everything would be done to mitigate its impact on other land uses. The site plan does not appear to do so. Um, and what we see on the site plan is uh, a, a level of mitigation that doesn't even meet uh, the bylaws as I read the bylaws. So page 50, sorry, page 50 of the Township Zoning Bylaws requires resource extraction areas, <coughs> sorry, to observe a 50, a 50 meter setback from uh, provincially significant woodland. Uh, the site plan does not do so. The plan seems to adopt the lower setback, which is required in the case of agricultural land. But of course, if it's rezoned, it won't be agricultural land anymore. And so the higher setback ought to apply. Page 99 of the Township Zoning Bylaws requires extraction to be kept at 150 meter distance from any house. Again, the site plan does not do so. So we aren't even given what the bylaws require, let alone any further mitigation that could be called for by the unique features of the site that the letters of objection uh, describe uh, so eloquently. Um, okay, so the specific impact on me, um, once again to repeat, there are important setback requirements under township uh, bylaws that the site plan ignores to the detriment of my property. And in addition to that, four things I'd like to mention. First of all, the site plan is required to indicate the place and function of all buildings within an affected radius. It doesn't do so, it leaves out the studio where I work, which is very close to the site boundary and which would be negatively affected by noise and vibration. And as my letter points out, I wouldn't be able to relocate my workplace because of the NE1 zoning um, of my property, which forbids further building. Um, secondly, Section 5 of the Aggregate Resources Act requires various things, such as processing, to be kept at a 90 meter distance from residential boundaries. Again, the site plan does not do so. Thirdly, the Hydrogeological Survey is required to give an accurate report on the water supply to neighbouring properties. Again, in my case, it does not do so. 
Fourth, the proposal states that the pit would operate for 12 hours a day. Actually, I don't think the company can actually uh, decide that because the township is responsible for setting hours of operation when other people's interests are affected. And it's entirely unreasonable to expect nearby residents to put up with incessant clanging and beeping during most of their waking hours during breakfast and lunch and dinner. It would deprive them of what the Environmental Protection Act calls, quote, normal enjoyment of their property. So that's all I want to say. Um, a terrible place to put a gravel pit. The level of mitigation proposed is inadequate by any standard. And if it goes ahead as proposed, the area would become a miserable place for me and my neighbours to live and work in. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your comments, Richard. Appreciate it. Clerk Witherspoon, do you have someone else uh, you would like to bring into the meeting? Uh, yeah, we have a we have a few more. Um, Jennifer Morris would like to speak now. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome, Jennifer. And we look forward to your comments. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. One second. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen. And. All right, uh, th thank you so much uh, for giving us this opportunity to comment, Mayor and uh, Council. I'll just uh, give you a little bit of background about myself. I'm new to this area, uh, moved to Goderich about five years ago, and um, I come from a bigger city, Burlington, and before that, Montreal. So part of my goal in life was to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city, and luckily, I happened to meet a lovely man who lived in Godrich and wanted to settle here. So um, I lucked out on a lot of levels. And um, I'm going to be personally and professionally affected by this uh, proposed pit if this uh, goes through. And obviously the zoning uh, amendment will be an important step in it happening. So I am hoping that you will see uh, the value of what everybody is saying and how this is not a great place for uh, this pit. So um, having left all this noise, dust and pollution, um, terrible water and industrial stuff, trucks and what have you, I'm just really happy to be in a place of peace and quiet. I just really want to leave you with a few things. I'm going to share with you a few um, technical issues as well as how this is going to affect um, myself personally and professionally as well as others. And uh, I just wanted to make the point that, you know, once something is done, it cannot be undone. The, that progress does not necessarily have to mean destruction of an environment. And just because a resource is there, it does not mean it must be taken. And that the resource that is the most important, really, when you think about it, is that there are all sorts of other resources there, which have all been mentioned. So I won't go over those in too much great, great detail. Um, I'm an athlete. I own a small gym in uh, ACW just north of the airport, just near the airport. And um, we have a lot of people who visit the area um, in the summer, especially. And one of the places we always send them as fitness enthusiasts is actually right down to Balls Bridge to um, cycle on the GDD Trail, to hike on the Maitland Trail and to canoe or kayak, whatever they're interested in, paddleboard in some cases, in some cases they like to fish. So it has, as everybody mentioned, an impact on tourism. Not being able to guide my clients that are visiting my gym, I believe will have an impact on my business. There have been mentions also of um, other businesses affected. Elizabeth was very eloquent in her description of her business and photographers. Um, and there's also a lot of other businesses that I think are going to be affected that have not been considered that really needs to be looked at um, everything from the Ben Miller Inn to other uh, tour operators to, um, you know, the G GDD Trail has now all kinds of um, uh, businesses that are opening along the trail to, or, you know, off offset from the trail to, um, accommodate uh, travelers along the way. So there's a lot of impact there on business that I think is not being considered in the application. I wanna share with you too, um, I have been involved with the Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes. I decided to get involved because I feel very passionate about preserving what we have culturally. I've seen so many things destroyed in the big city and um, you know, it's, it's such a shame when you 
walk down a street that used to have such charm and character to see just have nothing there anymore. And so I really don't want to see that happen in this area. And I decided to get involved um, and help with public awareness because in this day and age, there's so much noise out there that people don't necessarily what, know what's right under their nose. Um, and a lot of people aren't really even aware that of what is going on. They just see the Fisher Pit, for example, and assume it's a done deal. They don't understand the process. And so um, there's been a lot of education. To date, we have over 2,800 signatures on a petition that we started three weeks ago on a site called change.org. As was already mentioned, we've received over 150 letters of objection that we are aware of that were sent to Escher Planning and MNRF. Um, that was at the end of June. We have not, nobody has received responses to those objections or anything at all yet. So we don't know what's going on with that. We have a Facebook group of over 500 supporters and growing. Our Facebook page sees on average 10 to 20,000 interactions per week. And our website statistics are pictured here. Um, we have over 1,400 unique visitors per month. So we have, there's a lot of support to not have this pit happen. Um, this is just uh, some more photos of the community support that we have. Um, just showing you the photo of our change. This is a screenshot that I just took earlier today. 2,700 signatures in under uh, three weeks. And plus we had handwritten ones. There's a lot of um, elderly folks in the area who don't have email, who don't go online. And so we um, have been raising awareness with them. Many of these people have very, very fond memories of this area and are shocked when they learn about this. I did not include here the press that we have received over this in the Goderich Signal Star, in Post Media, CTV News, CKNX Radio. Um, so awareness is growing and um, support is growing. And so yesterday we actually had an amazing event. Over 100 people came out. Um, it was very successful. We had photos on the bridge. Um, we had, you know, people touring the area to just bring them to the area and show them what this is all about. So uh, it's, you know, you do have the support of your constituents here to not um, have this pit go through. I wanted to sh just highlight this because I find it kind of ironic that ACW and Huron County use images for, of Balls Bridge in their branding and uh, on their websites to announce meetings and um so I just wanted to kind of share that because it's interesting that that's there and yet we're talking about potentially destroying this area. And as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, you know, it is an oasis of quiet and country uh, cottage life. So it's really something that people are drawn to for that reason because of the peace and quiet. So just wanted to share with that with you uh, for the irony of it. Um, this is something that I just actually found um, today, and I wanted to highlight this because while we heard from Melanie at Escher Planning about what is in the official plan, there are parts of the official plan that, are, that she did not mention, and this is one of them um, that has to do, sorry, let me just move a few things around because I can't see what's on my screen. Um, this is part of the official plan, and this has to do with significant wildlife habitat, and I don't know if my mouse shows up on the screen, but we have in green here, all the significant wildlife habitat, including watercourses running directly through the, um, the proposed area, which are not mentioned on the application. So I just wanted to highlight that because this is something, as I was reviewing the official plan initially, I did not see. So I think it might be an update. And actually on the aggregate map, you can actually see this, uh, these watercourses. They're actually in purple on that map. So that's uh, just something I wanted to call to your attention um, because I think it's important that these things, these um, uh, features be considered. I also wanted to kind of um, expand on what Mr. Vernon said about the bylaws. These are actually screenshots of the ACW bylaws that talk about um, where aggregates should, where pitch should be able to go and the distances. So this is actually like quoting directly from them. And the application has not taken these into consideration. So I just want to make sure that um, this is on record, that we are supposed to have a 150 meter boundary from a residence that's not being respected in the application, that um, the significant woodlot 50 meter boundary, according to 
our bylaws here, 50 meters from all other significant natural features is not being respected, and 120 meters from significant wetland is not being respected. So that's um, of note. This is just um, a picture of the applicant's um, uh, plan and just showing the setbacks, which at most are 15 meters which has already been mentioned is well below what is supposed to be. Uh, ARA, I believe, is 30 meters and according to ACW is supposed to be um, 50 meters. So excuse my um, use of Google Maps and um, I wanted just to thank Elizabeth for helping me with this, but if we actually use Google Maps where you can actually um, put measurements on a map, the actual proposed area of the pit becomes much smaller and um, you know that is not something that is shown on the application and I would request that that be reviewed please. Um, so in conclusion I just have this picture of a scale because when it comes down to it for me I'm simple like to see things in clear just making it obvious we have on the one side we have dollars and we have one company on the other side we have hundreds of different reasons to not have this pit go through. Everything from that's been mentioned so far, wildlife, culture, picnics on the with your grandkids, uh, walking the dogs down the road, hiking, the little lakes, the impact on water. There's I could ramble on and on, but I won't because it's all being talked about and it's all in our objections. And so the question is, you know, what will tip the scale here? What do we value most? What is the legacy we want to leave for our children? It's not just about one thing. It's really about all of these other resources and what, and what actually matters most. So the question is, do we want this? I say, no, thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to be on tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, your, for your comments. Clerk Witherspoon, uh, do you have someone else you'd like to bring into the meeting at this time, please? Yes. So next up, we do have Rebecca Garrett back on. Um, now that she's she has introduced her uh, to the Friends of Alls Ridge, now she's uh, going to speak to her component of it as well. Welcome, Rebecca. Uh, maybe on mute, Rebecca, could please. Okay. Can you yeah, hear me good. now? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. I hope. Share. Okay. And um, okay, I'm just going to, I think I'll leave that up there. Um, I just want to start, normally I would do this at the beginning, but I was doing things out of turn tonight when I did the introduction, but I would like to um, just point out that all of us here tonight who are not Indigenous are uninvited guests on this land. Um, we all come with different beliefs and points of view. What we have in common is that we live on this land. It, it sustains us and without it we cannot live. So I want to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, and give further thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. And I'll just, um, Michael went into a lot of detail. I won't go into much more about um, our obligations, our treaty obligations, just to point out that, that I think we, we do share values of inclusion, accommodation, and protect, protection of Indigenous rights. We want to make sure that those are upheld. So um, again, my name is Rebecca Garrett, my family home, as I said. Oh, I'm gonna go full screen, I guess. Sorry. So, um, okay. Um, my family home is right across the road from the proposed Little Lakes Pit. Although my work and life and circumstances have led me to live in many other places throughout my life, this place has always been my home and always will be. My mother was a writer and poet and naturalist, an expert on Indigenous plants. Um, she believed in nature and the rights of nature. 
This is a concept that is now becoming known and worked with more broadly in a social and legal and cultural sense, as many communities over the world, world fight and win basic rights for rivers, for lakes, and for vulnerable land. Let's see if I can. The proposed below water level open pit uh, mining operation has shattered my family's sense of safety and security and thrown our basic human rights into question, not the least of which is the right to clean water and clean air. We are concerned about the quality of our water and about respiratory health from uh, toxic particulates, dust and exhaust fumes. In the very likely event that the gravel contains residues from 100 years of chemical use, we know that DDT, atrazine, and Roundup have been used on agricultural fields. We are concerned about the potential risk of toxic runoffs when those chemicals are disturbed in the mining process and the resulting contamination of the aquifer and the river and its watershed. Also calcium chloride emanates from quarry dust and poses self health concerns. And as pointed out earlier, the, the prevailing wet winds go from west to east. So everything um, will be blown potentially onto the river and onto the bridge and onto the homes beside the river there. Um, the, um, sorry. The little lakes will become dangerous for us to walk and ride on for our, us and our children, our friends and our guests and noise from trucks, excavators, or other equipment will affect wildlife, including fish, birds, and, and humans living in the area. Uh, it was noted before that the township's motto on its website is an oasis of quiet country and cottage life. And with such activities in place, the township will lose its stated character. Okay. Um, we have always been a diverse and rich community of farmers, writers, retirees, theater directors, and artists. As a child, I learned about agriculture and worked in the fields and gardens of our neighbors, helping with the chores. At the same time, I learned about the importance of history and cultural heritage from architect Nick Hill, who renovated the ball house on the hill overlooking the bridge and brought a frame of appreciation for the natural and built history of the area that was new to many of us. I learned about community theater from the director and actors who founded the Blythe Festival and stayed in the house across the road. I learned about painting from the works of Jack McLaren who lived in Ben Miller. I learned about the telling of stories from my mother's close friend, Alice Monroe, who was nurtured and inspired by this place and went on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature for her writing that is rooted in this location. In addition, our community is made up of many people from near and far who have had lifelong meaningful relationships to the bridge and to the Little Lakes Road. Balls Bridge is a significant cultural and tourist site. It defines our area and has been a destination for weddings, graduations, and family gatherings for many decades. It's a key repository of personal and cultural memories. So Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes grew out of what used to be Friends of Balls Bridge. The group Friends of Balls Bridge was formed in 2006 when Balls Bridge was threatened with demolition. The Friends of Balls Bridge received the 2008 Margaret and Nicholas Hill Cultural Heritage Landscape Award from the Architectural Conservancy. Citizens fought hard to save this historic treasure from demolition. It is now a heritage site and a popular recreational canoeing, fishing, wedding, and tourist destination. The proposed pit it would be operating just over 200 meters from the enjoyment of the historic bridge will be severely eroded by the presence of the proposed open pit mining operation, and it will undoubtedly impact recreational tourism. This is uh, just to point out again how the bridge is used in, um, this is a, I think a county um, publication about tourism. So it is used in both branding and, and advertising the, um, the things about the county that we're proud of and that we want to attract other people with. So we are deeply concerned there's been no consideration by Lobo Sand and Gravel of the value of the bridge to the Balls Bridge and the Lakes community or to the people of ACW Township 
or Central Huron, or Huron County, or to the province of Ontario, all of whom have made significant investments in the bridge. In fact, ACW and Central Huron townships, as well as Huron County, do use the bridge in their branding. So what does it say about our townships and our county if a symbol of its value is allowed to deteriorate and allowed to be devalued by an industrial below water level open pit aggregate mine. If bylaws are not in place to protect these valuable natural and cultural community assets, what will it take to do that before they're all gone? Can ACW or Central Huron or the Balls Bridge Steering Committee apply for a bylaw amendment to protect the area? Can Huron County help us do what is necessary to protect this area? Can the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority stand behind all of our efforts? As our environment changes, our legislation and mechanisms must change accordingly. Think about the response years ago to the realization that agricultural waste and toxins were running off fields into the river or the new legislation necessary along the banks of Lake Huron. Another question that needs more research relates to the cultural heritage landscape regulations and designations. We understand that under provincial guidelines, Balls Bridge and the area around it is already a cultural heritage landscape. However, this is not formalized in any township leg legislation that we know of, although we don't know it all. We haven't read it all. Um, um, uh, I'm going to read you a quote by Ben Holthoff, who is, uh, gave us a preliminary report from Letourneau Heritage Consulting, and they are experts in cultural heritage landscapes and planning, um, who's, who writes that a cultural heritage landscape study should be conducted to assess the impacts of the proposed aggregate operation on the bridge. And he says, we understand that there is an Ontario Heritage Trust plaque next to the bridge. The bridge appears to be recognized as a cultural resource in the Huron County Cultural Mapping Report from 2012. In my opinion, an evaluation of the bridge against Ontario Regulation 9-06 would likely find that it meets at least one and probably a few of the criteria for cultural heritage value. An evaluation based on research and a site visit would be necessary to confirm this. The Architectural Conservancy of Ontario Recognition, Ontario Trust Heritage Trust Plaque, and Cultural Mapping Report would be relevant supporting material. So is the township willing to engage the services of a planner specialized in cultural heritage landscape to assist us in finding the necessary mechanisms to protect this site? Or are you willing to work with Letourneau Heritage Consulting toward these aims if the Friends of Ballsbridge and the Lakes retains them? We are also concerned about the tourism and recreational value of Balls Bridge and the surrounding landscape. The application fails to consider the peace and tranquility of the area, and a number of other people have talked about that, and the effect on the, on the area by the noise, vibration, dust and truck traffic, etc. and the trail. Um, I won't go over the things that people have already spoken, so I'll... about in relation to, to so, little lakes. So um, just a couple more points. And one is about the official plan review. And um, I actually, I spoke to, to you, to all the councillors um, last, what was it, March. Um, during the official plan review, we made submissions. Um, on March 9th, myself and a number of others, I think there were about 12 of us who wrote letters of submission to the official plan review, asking that the designation of extractive in the area within the loop of the Minnesotung River, west of Balls Bridge, which includes the Little Lakes property, be reviewed and changed to agriculture or, na or natural heritage. Um, the, the submissions were acknowledged, but we have not heard anything since then about the request for a review of the extractive designation. And according to ACW's timeline for the review, there should have been a public meeting in June. However, we learned in July that the June meeting has been postponed until August the 11th. On June 23rd, we were informed that the public meeting about Lobo Sand and Gravel zoning change application would be on July 26th. 
So we not we do not fault the ACW planner for the scheduling, but from our point of view, it does not seem fair or right that the ACW township can prioritize the Lobo rezoning meeting and potentially change the zoning when their official plan is out of date and they have not completed the review. We also feel it's not fair or right that the official plan review is being delayed further by prioritizing Lobo sand and gravel zoning change application. Does the township not have an obligation to prioritize the interests of its citizens rather than a company owner from another jurisdiction? Also, if the official plan review had occurred when it was supposed to in 2013, the designation might have been changed and none of this would be happening now. We believe that the township and its, and, and its citizens should set the pace and that a change in zoning should not be considered until the official plan review process is completed and the plan is amended. Okay, another thing that, that we're really concerned about is the haulage route in the um, application of Lobo Sand and Gravel. And this is the uh, a page, the, the site from the site plan. And as you'll say, it says, uh, there's a note saying the plan not updated to reflect new entrance proposal. And what we've done a complicated situation to, to describe, but basically um, the route that is in the application that we all had to write letters of objection to is not it's, it's, the company is now saying they want to use a different route, but we were not allowed to address that route in our letters of obligation. So um, this affects the application process. And according to MNFR regulations, an amendment to a license cannot be made until the license is approved. But um, in order for it to be approved, it has to be approved with the haulage route through the Little Lakes Road and River Line. Um, so it's a bit of a, a catch-22 thing, I guess, here. And it means that and make the rezoning application at this time until the haul route issue is resolved. Um, so a letter of, from our lawyer has been attached to your packages, to the counselor's packages. Um, and basically it's just um, saying what I've just said in a bit longer. Well, I'll, I'll read a bit of it. Um, it has come to our attention that a significant issue with respect to the haul route has arisen that is not part of the Lobo Sand and Gravel application before council. Specifically, Lobo may be asking for an amendment to its license application at some future date to permit it to change the haul route from Little Lakes Road to Fisher Pit access on Lonsborough Road, a county road. It is our opinion that this cannot be done during the rezoning application process. Proceeding in this manner will depress noise and traffic safety resulting from increased traffic in a sensitive ecological area. Most importantly, our clients' letters of objection could not address this change and therefore no accommodation or mitigation will be proposed. Um, so he's, he ends by saying that any amendment by changing the route to the Lonsboro County Road must be made in the context of this Planning Act and Aggregate Resources Act application and statutory public meeting. And it is our respectful submission that the integrity of this process is at stake. So in conclusion, I just want to state again that this project will cause immeasurable stress, anxiety, pain, and suffering to countless people and impoverish our public sphere. So we object strenuously that one private landowner be allowed to destroy the land, disturb and obliterate complex, e complex ecosystems and species, and endanger the water, river, and lakes and our natural legacy. The consequences are dire. We believe that once destroyed, this rare and precious place will never recover. It cannot be restored to its present condition. This is forever. We owe it to ourselves, our children, and the future to save this green and generative place for generations of all living things. 
In this time of COVID and climate change, we have seen governments and industry finding new ways of doing things, new ways of organizing, new approaches to building and fabricating, and new models of governance and networks of care. Citizen groups have become increasingly important and integral in all levels of civic life and governance. We will continue to work hard to protect this unique and irreplaceable part of ACW Township. And we invite the Township of ACW to work with us to pass on the legacy to our children and their children and the generations to come. So thank you all for, live, for listening. And thank you also to all of the people who have been reaching out to Friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes Road with support and encouragement and sometimes just to tell you, tell us how much you value this area. And thank you again for listening. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for your insightful comments. Clerk Witherspoon, uh, do you have someone else that you would like to bring into the meeting at this um, time, please? So next on the list, I do have Gina McDonald who wishes to speak. Okay, thank you. Everybody hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you and see you, Gina. Welcome. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mayor McNeil and Council, for this opportunity to speak. And I will try to be as brief as possible. Um, with regards to Lobo Sand and Gravel's application for a, a zoning bylaw amendment, um, our planner, my fellow residents, and neighbors have presented the majority of the concerns. I would only like to mention that I also have not yet received a reply to my letter of objection from the applicant or its representatives. Although I don't live immediately in the area for which a zoning bylaw amendment is being sought, I'm very fond of this beautiful area and I'm concerned about this special part of our community. I'm also concerned about the loss of more ACW farmland and for the applicant's, applicant's lack of compliance to our municipality's regulations and guidelines for aggregate extraction. I've been helping out friends of Balls Bridge and Little Lakes or FOBL as I call them for short on an advisory basis due largely to my past experience with the process. Primarily, I'm here to speak to you tonight about a cumulative impact study. Councillors will have seen a copy of the cost estimate and description that was brought to council in October of 2018. It was included in tonight's meeting packages. With the current unrest over yet another application to amend a bylaw, from AG1 to ER1 for the purpose of extracting into the water table and with ACW undergoing its official plan review, it seems timely to bring this matter before you again. I've spoken recently with our planner and with most of councillors individually regarding a fresh look at the need for a cumulative impact study or CIS. The copy of the 2018 Dillon Consulting Cost Estimate and Description for a CIS attached to my presentation outline for tonight has a highlighted section indicating a key purpose for this study. It reads, this cumulative effects study is to provide supporting information to assist the township in its review of pit development applications and to support its position at possible future LPAT hearings. Gathered from my recent conversations with counselors, each of you have certain points you'd like addressed. These points can be used to help set the parameters for a revised and refreshed CIS, which might include how many licensed pits do we have, active and inactive, in how concentrated an area, how much of ACW is zoned extractive but not licensed yet, how will these numbers affect our community, what can we do to control or limit these, is there a way to control how many pits are active at one time, is there a way to ensure pits are rehabilitated before new licenses are issued or zoning bylaw amendments granted? How do other municipalities refuse below water extraction? How can ACW amend its official plan to better protect our farm and aggregate resources for the future while staying within the requirements set out by the province through the provincial policy statements and the Aggregate Resources Act? How can ACW protect itself against future LPAT hearings initiated by applicants, the public, and or our own community members? Have there been any similar studies done and what can we learn from them by the th things they did and didn't ask? How will this help us adjust the parameters of our own study and or the need for one? These are all questions that we'd like to see answered. 
To get complete and thorough answers, we need to consult with professional experts working within the industry itself. As some of you may remember, in 2018, the Maitland Valley Conservation Authority, with the township planner at the time, estimated a cost of well over 100,000 for a CIS. However, their guesstimate was based on a physical impact study, which included hydrogeology studies, environmental studies, etc., all of which are very uh, time consuming and costly and are already undertaken by aggregate applicants. Dillon Consulting's estimate of 35 to 40,000 was based more on the social impacts of ACW's extractive zoning and the rezoning application process. These are two very different studies, which explains the huge discrepancy in timelines and cost estimates. The cost of a CIS will no doubt have increased and will largely be based on the parameters set out for the study by ACW. As one count at hearing later. Even if this only saves us from one hearing, it will have paid for itself. Done right, it could save us from many hearings down the road as the demand for our aggregate resources to rise and our community with the not at the expense of food, water, and our livelihoods. Moving forward, we need to suggest that this is the perfect time for us to look at the big picture for ourselves and for the future of our municipality and our family. Please consider Consider directing our clerk and planners to look for it as soon as possible with results being implemented, implemented sorry, in this current official plan review. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina, for your comments. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Clerk Witherspoon, would you like to bring anyone else into the meeting, please? Um, yep, next up. We Of Nancy Craig, who requested to speak tonight. Press the meeting if you care to. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Nancy. Thank you. Hi, I'm going to wake everybody up. All right. It's like I said to you, Mayor McNeil, if this was Star Wars, Star Wars, Lobos would be the Death Star, and I would be a fighter pilot in the Resistance, along with all the other people who have spoken to you. So what I want to do is just address some laws and your duties and responsibilities for the Municipal Act. You took an oath of office, all of you, councillors and mayor, and in your oath of office, you were sworn to represent the public and to consider the well-being and interests of the municipality. What the municipality is is that this is not good for us for many, many reasons, but also because it goes against So, first of all, we have your, your role as, as council is to represent the public, and to consider the well being and interests of the municipality. We're trying to tell you this is not in our best interest. All right. And if you just stay with me for a moment because I have some notes here. Okay. So that's the first reason why you have to vote no. You do not really have a choice. 
what you have to uh, to state um, in your roles, you just you have to vote no. Then we come to Minister Thompson's CV. Under Minister Thompson's the provision obligating her to protect farmland and foster sustainable economic development as other departments also have. Okay, now, so, climate scientists, same thing for decades now. We know what needs to be done, and they immediately halt all fossil fuel expansion, and massive investment must be made in a clean, green economy and that leaves no one behind. So you were obligated by your oath of office to vote no. Then there are key federal laws Environmental Protection Act, the Fisheries Act, the Impact Assessment Act, the Transportation of Dangerous Goods Act, and the Canadian Navigable Waters Act. The Environmental Protection Act is the legislation for environmental protection in Ontario. It grants the history of the environment conservation and broad powers to deal with the discharge of contaminants and negative effects. As you know from the report I sent you, that gravel dust is going to travel 161 mile radius. I live in Seaforth. We're right in the line of fire. I own a business that caters to tourists. What am I going to say to them? Oh, come on down. See the great big hole in the ground where nature used to exist. And stop by the gift store and pick up a big jug of poison water. I don't think so. We, you cannot do this to any of us. Not to the people who live here. To tourism not to agriculture. So now I want to talk to you about the Aggregate Resources Act because that's come up. The minister may revoke any permit. Consider, he has to consider the issuance, transference, or continuation of the permit to be contrary to public interest. We're telling you this is contrary to public interest. So now we get to the Endangered Species Act. Biological diversity is among the greatest treasures of our planet. Does anybody disagree with that? So biological, social, economic, cultural, and intrinsic value. The biological diversity makes many essential contributions to human life, which you have to protect us. We are asking you to protect our lives. Our lives are in danger from the aggregate dust, the contamination, the carcinogenics it brings, water is in danger. The, the river is in danger. Lake Huron is in danger. So we have to consider the biological diversity is as sustainable social and economic development. And now I want to get to my point of how I do not consider aggregate extraction to be sustainable economic development. Nobody can. It only lasts two years. Farmland, agriculture, tourism, those things are forever. We have a duty and obligation to protect them. 
So you also have a duty to uphold the spirit and the letter of the laws of Canada, Ontario, and the laws and policies adopted by council. Members shall uphold the spirit and letter of the laws of Canada, Ontario, and the laws and policies adopted by council. These above statements are key principles are intended to facilitate an understanding, application, and interpretation of the code of conduct. The principles are not operative provisions of the code of conduct and are not intended to be enforced independently as such. That is your code of conduct. Under the provincial policy statements, the provincial policy policy statement provides for appropriate development while protecting resources of provincial interests, public health and safety, and the quality of the natural and built environment. The provincial policy statement supports improved land use, planning and management, which contributes to a more effective and efficient land use system. So, we're obligated by law to protect the resources of provincial interest, that being Falls Bridge, the G2G Trail, tourism, and sustainable economic development. Protect our health and safety. Protect the natural and built environment, the rivers, the well water, the flora, the fauna, the endangered species, and all other species old growth forest, tourism, agriculture, Lake Huron, and most importantly, the people. Improve land use planning and management by writing and enacting bylaws that will protect us. We need to be protected and future generations need to be protected from aggregate pits. By preserving farmland, and tourism, which is sustainable economic development, and we're far more in terms of contribution to the economy and protecting tourism, also sustainable economic development, and also contributing billions to the economy, outweighing whatever aggregate does $17 billion. So if you don't vote no, you, you are obligated to vote no under your oath of office, your code of conduct, the laws of the federal government, Canadian Environmental Protection Act, the Fisheries Act, and the Canadian Navigable Waters Act, the Aggregate Resources Act, and the Provincial Policies. You're obligated under your own bylaw, which also states it's advisable to regulate the use of land situated within the defined areas as hereinafter designated for the purpose of preventing any further development which would create an adverse effect on the corporation and to prevent the use of lands jeopardize future orderly development and expansion and to protect the natural environment. That's your own bylaw. Uh, Michael Gregg talked to you about his feelings. Elizabeth talked to you about her feelings. Rebecca, Jennifer, everybody who has spoken here today has told you about the disadvantages of allowing this pit. Wildlife habitats are destroyed forever. Valuable agriculture land is taken away forever. Quarrying creates pollution from noise and dust. According to locals, 12 hours a day times six days a week, that's 72 hours a week that you expect the people listen to that, to breathe that, to never be able to go outside again, 
to never be able to hang their laundry on the line because that's going to get contaminated. The aggregate dust is going to eat balls bridge. So, mining activity. The social challenges related to the increase in quarrying activities in general include threats to health and safety, displacement of communities, damage of cultural sites. This is nothing new. This is what quarries do. You, you just have to vote no. Okay. And so now I'm going to evoke our rights under the Environmental Bill of Rights. The people of Ontario recognize the inherent value of the natural environment. The people of Ontario have a right to a healthful environment. The people of Ontario have a the protection, conservation, and restoration of the natural environment for the benefit of present and future generations. And the purposes of this act are to protect, conserve, and where reasonable, restore the integrity of the environment, to provide sustainability of the environment by the means provided in the act, and to protect the right to a healthful environment by the means provided in the act. So basically, we're, we're asking you have to protect us. You have to protect the environment, our shared culture and heritage, tourism, farmland, and the people who live within a 160 kilometer radius. You are obligated to vote no under the provincial policy statement that contains your oath of office. Because of the federal government, Canadian Environmental Protection Act, the Fisheries Act, the Canadian Navigable Waters Act, the Aggregate Resources Act, and the Environmental Bill of Rights. The truth is Alice can check it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is, the truth. And the truth is, you have to vote no. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thank you very much for your comments, Nancy. Kirk Witherspoon, uh, do you have uh, someone else to bring in the meeting, please? Yep. Um, right now we have Wendy Hornig who has requested to speak. Thank you. Welcome, Wendy. And if you would like to turn on your video and unmute yourself, we welcome your comments. Wendy, if you would like to turn your video on and unmute, please proceed with your comments. Um, what we can do, Mayor McNeil, and in order to keep things rolling here, we do have one more person who did request to speak, and I know that her hand is raised. Um, and if Wendy does come in in the meantime, if she could just raise her hand, and then we can let you into the meeting, Wendy, if you can hear me. Um, so at this point, I do have Kaylin Prophet who would like to speak. Perfect. Thank you very much. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Kaylin. And if you'd like to turn your video on, uh, please uh, make your comments. Absolutely. Uh, just one second. It's uh, not letting me turn on my camera. I'll, uh, I'll ask my question while I try to get that figured out. 
Um, so touching on what the last lady said, um, I, I actually wasn't going to speak tonight initially, so I wasn't really prepared. But I would also agree that you guys are obligated to like to vote no under your current positions. Like uh, the goal of the meeting tonight, from my understanding, was to come to the general community and get an idea of what the best interests of the community were. And under my understanding with you guys, your guys' job is to act in the best interests of that community. Uh, and out of everybody that I've heard spoke tonight, I would say it's pretty fair to say that we haven't heard anybody speak in anything positive about having this pit here. I haven't heard anybody about our community come forth and say, hey, we really want to have this here. Hey, I think this would provide positive benefit to the area. Everyone recognizes that there is an income value there that's associated with it, but it's just the positives don't outweigh the negatives for people within our community. And I haven't heard a single person here tonight that's come forth to talk that disagrees with that. So um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, I can't seem to get my camera working, but if you look up the rehabilitation plan there, uh, they said their goal was to repurpose the uh, site for agricultural and uh, natural use, uh, I believe earlier on, correct me if I'm wrong. But if you look at the rehabilitation plan, I, I don't understand how you could possibly repurpose that property for agricultural use. Like actually, it, do it doesn't look feasible on their plan. They have a small strip of land that goes in between the woods and this massive pond, almost lake, back into a very small open area and then down to another lake. So to even make this property usable, you would have to remove that entire set of woods, which is the primary part of the like, forest we're trying to protect. There is, so I don't, like, it's, it's not a feasible rehabilitation plan. There is no way for that to be agriculturally feasible. There isn't enough room there to farm that. Anyways, that's, that's all I had to touch on tonight. I just, I, I don't see how you would, would view that as feasible or how you would interpret the will of the community as anything other than not wanting this here. Uh, and I would ask that you go and review that rehabilitation plan and uh, look at it as if you were purchasing the property when Lobo, Lobo Sand Gravel is done with this. If you were a farmer and you were going to come here, how would you repurpose that for agricultural use? I'm looking at it right now as if I was about to buy it. and I just don't see any way I would make it work without possibly removing that set of woods. And if you're looking at it right now, I'm sure you guys see the same thing. You're not dumb. You've lived in Huron County your whole lives. There just isn't the room there to farm that, man. That's not repurposable for agricultural use. Nine. 99% of the property is gone, and then there's forest and two ponds left. That's it. Anyways, thank you, and have a wonderful day, and I uh, really appreciate you guys having me. Sorry for uh, being a little less eloquent than everyone else here this evening. No problem. Kalen, thank you very much for your comments. <laughs> Bye now. So we do have Wendy. Um, she is, uh, she's participating, so uh, Caitlin, if you could bring her in, that would be great. Good evening, Wendy, and if you would care to turn your video on and unmute, uh, please uh, make your comments that you would like to, if you would. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Wendy, and please turn your okay. uh, video on if you'd I care was to. Trying to. I'm trying to, I'm not, I am not very, um, uh, I'm an old biddy. I don't handle the technology very well. <laughs> you're good on both fronts. You have your video on and you're unmuted. So please proceed. All right. Your I'm there now. Okay. I'm going to have to read because I've got a lousy memory and very bad eyes. So, no problem. Uh, we'll see how I can manage. I'll be brief. It seems to me that, that our environmental um, ethical standards are woefully lacking. Otherwise, you, our township councillors, wouldn't have been put in this painful position of having to make this decision. I feel for you. Uh, strong local, stronger local environmental um, protection regulations would have made this step unnecessary. It's interesting that planners can seriously limit what we are allowed to do on our own property, but with the stroke of the pen, the quality of life of many can be damaged or completely destroyed, as we have seen with so many of the people who uh, have properties in this area. And um, and the, and the value of their property uh, seriously decimated. How can this be right? How can it be allowed? It just seems so extremely wrong. 
um, how many of us would like want to be living in the place across the road from this or in the, um, in that um, artistic studio in the middle of the uh, pit section. It's a horrendous idea. It's obvious that there is a, um, a high demand for gravel in the southern part of our province and our co county has a lot of it in our fields and our hills. It would be acceptable that we, it, I mean it should be acceptable that we can share our excess but you know what? The urban owners of the gravel companies don't give a coot, a hoot about our quality of life with of us country bumpkins way out here in Huron County. They don't have to live with the results right beside their own homes and in their neighborhoods. Do we really have to destroy one of our most beautiful places um, or our environmentally sensitive areas in order to provide them with this plentiful commodity? Do we have the right to risk spoiling the multitude of pastimes already described by plunking gravel pits next to the riverbanks? Places that rightfully would be avoided if we followed the knowledge and experience of the environmental experts. It would be, uh, it would feel great to be wise enough to refuse to put these irreplaceable areas at risk. Are you 100% are you sure that the groundwater, 1000% sure that the groundwater supplies needed by our inhabitants, human and animal, will truly be fully protected? Do you have the determination, the integrity and the fortitude to stand up for and protect the areas that absolutely should not be put at risk? Um, uh, most importantly, the, the wrong choice, sorry, if the wrong choice is made, the, uh, oh, and this, this is not meant as an insult, it's just as a reflection of possible reactions. Um, if the wrong choice is made, the reputation of your family names will be tainted for, uh, the for, for into the foreseeable future as the ones who gave, gave in to political pressure of the urban com companies who want to get rich on us. When future generations drive down the hill onto Balls Bridge and are confronted with the ugly open sore of the gravel pit instead of the existing serene beauty, do you want them to remember? Do you want them to remember that it was you who were the ones who allowed it? And I have a very serious. Um, oh, what is that? Thing? Um, sorry. I have an overwhelming skepticism about their promises for rehabilitation. All we have to look do is look around at the gravel pit areas in our county and not be impressed. How about the area on, on the, um, just adjacent to, to this area? Uh, wait a minute. I'm trying to, uh, is, is it the extension of um, Riverline? There's an area there that they've been taking gravel out for years they, they, what we tend, what we see, is that they stop pulling gravel for a while in order to not have to rehabilitate, and they say, "Oh, we have some more to get," and that means that they, meanwhile, for decades, these ugly sores are sitting there waiting and waiting. Uh, like that other gentleman, I, I cannot see that that area is is indeed possible to rehabilitate. I'd love to see the possibility. When in the, um, if the dust and the uh, silt of gravel cleaning contaminates the, the Maitland River, do you want to be the ones uh, blamed because you allowed the gravel uh, extraction to be on the river corridor where below ground water levels? I feel pretty sure that you'd rather be known as the group of brave, determined community defenders who were able to look past the lure of a temporary fix of new money, knowing that the wrong choice will, will uh, plunge us all into an extended future in which vital areas are forever damaged or destroyed. We are counting on you to choose what is right for the, uh, for the future generations, yours and ours, who are heading this way. And such a decision will not de deny the Southern Ontario uh, for their needed gravel. They will just take another look and choose another area where gravel can be mined without effect, um, negatively affecting 
rivers, lakes, groundwater, or favorite community locations. They do exist. And I firmly believe that we can be assured that this is exactly the result, what the result will be of denying them the Little Lakes location. They'll get their gravel. So there are so many people counting on you. Please make the choice that you can be proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy, for your comments. Clerk Witherspoon, uh, do we have anyone else with the raised hand function that would uh, request to be able the opportunity to speak this evening? So at this time, I don't see anyone else who has made the request to speak. Um, we'll give maybe a minute and then, uh, then we can uh, move on with the agenda. Okay, thank you. If there is anyone that would like to speak, members of the public, please use the raised hand function and Caitlin will bring you into the meeting. And if there's none. I don't see anybody who's, who's raising their hand at this time. Thank you, Kirk Witherspoon. I'll now call on members of council. Do you have any questions or comments that any members of council would like to make at this time? Seeing none, we're good. Okay, with that, we do have a recommendation from our county planner that uh, this public meeting was held tonight for to review application 07-21 under section 34 and 51 of the Planning Act for the purpose of obtaining input from members of the public and receive this report for information purposes. A future report containing policy review, written responses to public comments, and a recommendation will follow once comments are received and application submissions are finalized. That is the recommendation and I would request a show of hands if we are in support of this recommendation. And that is supported from council. Thank you very much. Uh, Selena, would you care to uh, comment? Uh, Councillor Vanstone, please. Um, yes, Mr. Mayor. And I, I don't know if this is the proper time. I know we need uh, information back. But um, that uh, study that uh, Gina McDonald uh, brought forward, I would be really interested in having that come back to council that we could talk about it at a council meeting. And I don't know if this is the place to bring it up or not, but uh, if not, I can send a email to the uh, clerk or the CEO asking for that to happen. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Vanstone. I think that would be an appropriate action uh, to do so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Watt, please. Thank you. I'm having trouble with my audio, so and maybe Bill already asked this, but uh, from my point of view, there are seven or so documents that our planner, Selena, listed in her presentation that were submitted. I haven't seen any of them. There are three independent reviews that have been conducted. I haven't seen any of them. There are apparently responses to some of them. I haven't seen any of those. Uh, before this ever comes to a public meeting for the purpose of and calling a vote, uh, I think we all need to see those things. Okay, thank you very much. That is a comment well taken. Any other questions or comments from any members of council? We do have a recommendation that I read from our county planner that we receive this uh, for information and we will follow up at a future meeting to deal with this and I will again ask for a show of hands from council in support of this. And that is supported. Thank you very much. Selena, the effect of public and agency comments. Do you have a comment on this, please? Would not necessary, Clerk Witherspoon. Okay, perfect. Thank you. With that, I would like to thank uh, everyone for your presentations this evening. And I would entertain a mover and a seconder to adjourn this planning advisory committee meeting. Moved by Councillor Forrester, seconded by Councillor Snowblin, that there being no further business, the public meeting be hereby closed at 9.39 p.m. All in favor of the motion. And that is carried. I thank you very much. And I would entertain a mover and a seconder to reconvene our council meeting. And that is moved by the Deputy Mayor Watt, seconded by Councillor Forster, that Ashfield, Coburn, Walmanosh, 
A township council hereby reconvenes our regular meeting. All in favor of the motion. And that is carried. I thank you. And a mover and a seconder to adjourn, if you would, please. Councillor Van Stone moves. Uh, Councillor Fisher seconds that Ashfield, Colburn, and Wawanosh Township Council does now adjourn to meet again on the third day of August at 9 a.m. or at the call of the mayor. All in favor of the motion. That is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our staff for your very capable uh, expertise in bringing individuals into the meeting tonight. It's much appreciated. Uh, Clerk Witherspoon and to uh, also uh, all members and to Selena. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you very much again to all members of the public and have a good evening. Thank you.